Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan M.S. Pierce. Team, my second favourite team in the world. Sorry, not my favourite because Pompey are top of the league at the moment and they're going to get promoted to the championship at the end of this season. They will. It will happen. No, you're my favourite team. No, seriously. No, 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 you are. Anyway, let's go to a random icebreaker to start. I mean, I haven't done one of these update extras for so long because I'm pumping out so much other content that, that I just don't have time often. And finally, I just have a, a snatch of, a, of 20 minutes to be able to just spend some time talking about some of these contextual areas concerning the war. This isn't one of those areas, but it's a bit of an icebreaker into what we're going to talk about. This is less serious than the thread I'm going to share with you. But I do want to just... This has been hanging around on a on a sticky note waiting for me to to show you i just i don't want to be dismissive of the indian army here I presume it's the indian army i uh, just don't know what's going on it might not be the indian i don't know what army it is actually uh but anyway it is just wholly bizarre I mean, yes, there are some weird traditions and rituals in different armies around the world, but I, I'm not sure that's the most efficient way. I mean, you're going to be using up a lot of energy just moving, doing stuff like this. Anyway, we are basically, we are going to be talking about India with regard to Russia, uh, and we're going to be talking about the the closeness that they have. Well, it's more of a, a relationship that's one of practicalities, a marriage of convenience. You, you have BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the attempt to create an alternative to the US hegemony around the world. And then, you know, how, how much are India and some other countries willing to work with each other? There are some issues between India and China, issues between China and indeed Russia and India and Russia. They're not like the closest of bedfellows. We're going to talk about India liking a good deal here. This is a thread from Alexander Strahel, um, who is a commodity investor. Um, and this is a talk about crude oil and the relationship, the trade relationship between Russia and India. So it's, um, it's about to teach Russia a lesson about what it means, India is, because it likes a good deal. Spoiler one, it's not a pretty one. And two, China and Turkey will learn quickly. The... the, the the broad position here is that, and we, we've seen this for a long time, since the beginning of the war, that if you sanction Russia and if you put price caps on Russian oil and if you stop buying hydrocarbons off them or reducing the amount, then in then China have, uh, sorry, Russia have to go and sell that elsewhere. And, and the problem is the big buyers elsewhere that would, would happily take the bulk off Russia are in the buying position, right? So they know that Russia will be desperate to sell this. And so as soon as you know that they're desperate to sell that, you say, yeah, I'll buy that and I'll buy loads of it. And I'm going to buy it at an absolutely knockdown price, a super cheap price, because you ain't got a choice, mate. And we want loads of that and we want it cheap. And we're going to take the crude oil off you. And we we're not going to take the refined oil, but you're going to give us a higher value. We are going to take the lowest value stuff off you. And we are going to give jobs to our own people in the refining industries in our, in our own countries so that we add the value to that. And then we're going to be the ones who export it around the world as refined oil products. So there's lots to gain uh, for countries like India here. Now, as the thread starts, before the invasion in February 2022, Russia exported some 2.8 million barrels per day. That's 55% of their 5.5 million barrels a day of crude to Europe. So over half their crude went to Europe by way of a pipeline, the Drisba pipeline and sea transportation, seaborne. But not just crude oil. They Russia also sold products such as diesel or jet or jet products to Europe for a total of 1.4 million barrels per day in petroleum ex uh, product exports. So in other words, G7 sanction uh, as introduced in December 2022 required 4.2 million barrels per day of crude and other products to be reshuffled globally. So, so Russia, due to the sanctions, needed to get rid of 4.2 million barrels a day of, the, of oil products. 
Those are big numbers. So back then, Alexander Strahel, I, he says, I argued Russia will struggle to find new markets to replace such volumes as only China and India could move that the dial on that. So that only they could take on such huge volumes. Yet China's strategy is to keep procurement diversified, which leaves little room for increases. I mean, that that's useful. So rather than so you energy independence or energy security is is either about producing everything yourself or if you can't do that buying but don't buy from one country because then that country holds power over you or if something goes wrong with that country you're suddenly cut off so you diversify your portfolio and if one of those countries screws up you can just up a little bit from each of the other countries and you can you can easily taken board the amount that you would normally import from country x over all, from all your other other countries so that's what china apparently uh, seeks to do um uh, so that proved to be correct um however i underestimated india's ability and willingness to step in and throw middle eastern imports under the bus but india likes a good deal and got offered big discounts you can remember india is the most populous country in the world over a billion people um so it went from near zero to 1.8 million barrels per day crude imports from Russia in 2023. So since then, however, the combo of fully absorbed Ural volumes and OPEC plus cuts reduced Euro discount to $12, while India remains the buyer of last resort for Russian crude, Turkey's additional 200,000 barrels per day do not move the Russian dial, which is, so why buy such volumes at higher prices? Let's translate that a little bit. So Ural the Russian crude oil suffered not only in terms of the the sanctions, meaning that they can't sell to many countries and then having to sell that elsewhere, but OPEC plus. So OPEC, this group of oil producing countries are acting like effectively like a cartel, then taken on other countries uh, into an OPEC plus regime, which Russia is a member. They OPEC plus then agreed to cut supply of oil they've done this several times in order to keep the price high so supply and demand the, the the rarer things are the more you can sell them for so diamonds are rare in fact so diamonds are a good example because actually they're not as rare as you think but certain people keep hold of the amount of diamonds so that they are effectively rare on a marketplace and then that means that that they can command a great price because there's there's more demand than there is supply and so so the price is, is kept high. You know, if diamonds were as rare as sand, right? Sand isn't worth what diamonds is. Sand is, like, there's no difference. Okay, one looks a bit prettier to most eyes. But if, in other terms, it's just like bits of stuff, right? So, you know, the more stuff you have, the cheaper it is. Um, now, OPEC Plus have cut, they, they control the supply into the world markets to make sure they get an optimal kind of price for, for their products so that they can maximise long-term profits on on oil now the problem is with russia is that they had to agree to cut supply to keep the the prices high but they were also not able to sell to europe and and g7 countries and so they had a double whammy not only had uh western entities like bp shell exxon mobil etc etc pulled out of russia and so they were not getting the support in drilling and storing and and transporting this this stuff and refining it so it, it was becoming more expensive and more problematic but then they they couldn't sell it and then the, they had to agree to sell less of it anyway so it's like a real, it's like a triple whammy, which means that they, Russia, are going to not be making as much money on hydrocarbons by a long shot as they previously were. Um, right. So anyway, moving on. When Ural, uh, well, Ural loadings headed for India in 2024 suggest India won't buy. So sorry, just to rewind a little bit. So um the euro discount uh, was reduced to twelve dollars. While India remains a buyer of the last resort for Russian crude. So the thing is, like India was was hoovering up some of this stuff. Then they weren't buying from India before. Then they were hoovering it up, uh, but at a really discounted price. So ideally, Russia would like to sell it to someone else. Um, but the question is, well, who else? Who can buy that volume that they had just sitting around? Given that they've had to make cuts in in 
so they just producing more and more but can't sell it because OPEC plus have cut and can't sell it because G7 countries won't take it. So anyway, URL loadings headed for India in 2024 suggest that India won't buy 1.8 million barrels per day at current prices anymore. So there was talk about India adhering to some of the sanctions as well. Um, so starting in February, India loaded uh, less than 1 million barrels per day and as little as 0 0.5 million barrels per day in the last two weeks. I guess that brings us back to my original thesis about the difficulty to find new markets. Um, so Indian crude imports and loadings from Russia. So this shows that, as you can see, it's it's really low in, what's that, uh, 2024, week 13. So, uh, you know, I guess that, what, three months in, almost three months in to, uh, to the year, yeah, India is not importing much from Russia. For the avoidance of future confusion, URLs from the Baltics takes 30 plus days, 45 not using the Suez Canal. And that means reduced loadings will show up as reduced imports only in the second half of March and in April. So yeah, the loadings means that they're, they're not loading up as much. And then I guess that then you have the difference between loadings and what's actually finally getting to, uh, in this case, India. Is it just about price? I think so. The Indian economy has enormous momentum. Product consumption reached uh, new all-time highs in 2024, one of the few bright spots in global petroleum consumption. Likewise, there is no shift in the Indo-Russo relationship where I sit. So in other words, India is just playing uh, an economic game here. Um, you know, and and reaping the rewards under Narendra Modi, Narendra Modi, India cemented its own political dominance. While peace matters traditionally, the relationship to the Kremlin matters more. Here's a good podcast discussing it, discussing it from multiple aspects in a recent foreign affair review. Uh, you can go and check that out if you, if you are so inclined. So do sanctions matter? Possibly. G7 sanctions meant to keep euros flowing, but to force Russia to sell it for a cat price at lower than $60 per barrel. So I've talked to you about that before. Just to remind you, the West with the sanctions didn't want oil to stop being exported from Russia because if you stopped Russia completely exporting oil, then you would you would starve the global supply of oil. So again, there's less oil around, which means it's going to be more expensive, like the diamonds. And if it's more expensive, you have an energy crisis and people can't get energy. I and mean, you're talking about petrol for cars and energy for making anything, etc., etc. And so you, you have inflation. You would have just an energy crisis that would cause inflation. So Western countries didn't want that. It would be an absolute disaster. But you don't want Russia making loads of, of money as well so they they were going for this sweet spot of like okay because we can control maritime insurance through london through lloyd's maritime insurance and so on and so forth we can make sure that no ship can get maritime insurance if they're selling euro oil for above 60 dollars a barrel which means that they the russians can sell it but they're making minimal profit off it and that's the best we can hope for which is they're making way less off oil than they were they were budgeting for back in like say 2021 um so there you go so uh g7 sanctions meant to keep euros flowing but to force russia to sell it for a cap price or lose the ability to use eu shipping services however the cap was only loosely enforced while the greeks continued to transport it and the problem is you had these ghost ships uh and you know transponders being turned off and and oil moving from one ship to another and so on and so forth is all highly and it remains highly controversial uh, and so this has been the price of euro oil which is at the moment just above uh, you know between 60 and 80 so 70 dollars which is obviously not cool it should be below 60 as it certainly was when they you know previously or back here during the um the, I guess the height of the sanctions here, but it has been lower depending on global uh, oil prices and whatnot previously, and obviously spiked at the beginning of the war there, uh, as as we remember. Right. So Russia also built a large dark fleet to maintain its export potential, but likely without proper insurance and maintenance. That's now a global issue, as it bears a risk of a non-insured oil spill. Does it matter for India? I don't know. Um, but it seems Western policymakers are waking up to the issue at last. Will they try to force Russian crude volumes back down to the G7, uh, back into the G7 fleet, 
or out of the market and away from the dark fleet, did this matter for lower Indian loadings too? I don't know. So I, I don't know whether they're... I mean, there's supposedly these pressures on India and India are not buying as much. There was, there was some of the claims that I reported to you recently. I don't know what what the exact details are concerning that. Um, uh, there's, he's just referring to an interesting piece on the role of sanctions. They argue that India bought less euros starting in November 2023 due to better sanction enforcement. Uh, but I cannot see that in the data, hence why I argue it's about price rather than sanctions. So that's starting in November. And that was kind of what I'm talking about recently, how you know the idea is that India are buying less due to due to sanctions, possibly. And meanwhile, Novak announced production costs due to reduced refinery capacity issues. Uh, in early March, the Deputy Prime Minister said that Moscow will cut its output by 350,000 barrels per day in April and by 400,000 barrels per day in May and by 471,000 barrels per day in June. So this is likely um, due to the attacks on the oil ref refining uh, infrastructure within Russia that we've seen recently. Uh, Russian refinery runs are also down unseasonally. Did Ukrainian attacks on refiners start to matter for 400,000 barrels per day? Did sanctions matter for past maintenance work? Both China and India should be able to assist. I'm not sure what to read into it here. So there's there are many variables and many unknowns still. What about the Suez Canal issue? There are 30 to 50 tankers passing through the Suez Canal, north to south, sea below. The number is lower south to north, and so not sure that matters either. So in summary... Uh, he says, and, and much of this will go over our heads, right? But global crude price balances should tighten by 0 0.5 plus thousand barrels per day in quarter to 2024 due to reduced euro volumes, but it could become more in absence of bigger discounts soon. Tanker rates should hold up on above issues. Dark goes white. I don't know what that means, but I, I guess that means that like, the, pr the price of... Um, of transporting the crude should hold, um, but China will ask for euro, lower euro prices too. So China could well muscle in on on trying to extract oil from Russia at really really beneficial prices, and then that would mean that Kremlin tax revenues will weaken versus where they were in 2023, which is of course problematic considering where they were previously. So anyway, uh, there you go. That is uh, Indian crude. Uh, for you and, and, and some, some information concerning Russian exports. Now, I haven't done a weapon thread for a long time, so let's do one on the MIM-104 Patriot. Ukraine lost a couple of Patriots recently, uh, launches that is, it, it appears, and that will be uh, quite a loss. But Patriot batteries are large things with many components, and so possibly just losing a couple of launches is, is the least worst uh, way of losing some Patriot capability. Uh, comparison with the S300 PMU and why it is so advantageous for Ukraine. Okay, so Patriot has become more famous recently due to its performance in Ukraine, where it shot down the unstoppable hypersonic missile, the Kijal, was responsible for um, aerial ambush that downed three Russian Su-34 fighters last December, and more recently is a main suspect for the downing of a Beriev A-50U extremely rare airborne early warning and control aircraft in the Russian Air Force, where it is estimated that fewer than 10 such aircraft are in service. So the S-300 versus the Patriot. This is what the S-300 looks like, the very kind of famous barrels that you see uh, in those ones that, that do their parades in, in Moscow and whatnot, compared to something that looks far more kind of NATO-esque in, in the kind of square tube launchers. Um, the S-300, okay, the most advanced version of the S-300 available in Ukraine is the S-300 PMU, which uses 30 N6 radar with a range of 300 kilometers capable of detecting 100 targets and engaging six simultaneously. The system also features a 76 N6 radar specialized in countering low-flying threats such as cruise missiles with a range of about 120 kilometers. Okay, so that, that's a bit on their capabilities. In short, the most advanced S-300 
in Ukraine is a system dating back to the mid-1980s, while still capable of posing a danger and representing risks to fixed wing aircraft, it is unquestionably dated due to Ukraine's inability to modernise these systems due to lack of financial resources leading them to continue with the outdated system, albeit maintained in usable condition. So while the Ukraine have these S-300s and they are fairly capable and can, as mentioned, you know, hit, hit some targets uh, over fairly usable distances, could, you know, even taking detecting 100 targets and engaging six of them at the same time, the these need upgrading, right? The Russians have the S-400 and some more upgraded versions of the S-300 uh, that they can draw from. The Patriot, though, received by Ukraine is a more updated system. Considering Ukraine has packed three missiles in its arsenal, spe specially developed to intercept ballistic missiles in their terminal phase, so just as they come down you know, really quickly and very, very steeply, and have shown success against a hypersonic Kinjal missile. It's expected that the radar used in the battery is the NAMPQ-65 version, upgraded version of the NAMPQ-53 radar, designed to have better radar resolution range and simultaneous tracking capability. While the data on the NAMPQ-65 is still classified, public data shows performance similar to that of the NAMPQ-53, with the ability to detect targets up to 160 kilometers away and track more than 100 targets simultaneously. Superficially, the two systems are quite analogous with few differences between them. But why does Ukraine like the Patriot so much? Why is it so necessary for the country that has similar systems like the S-300? Well, one of the main advantages of the Patriot that often goes unnoticed is its availability. Despite the intense debate that occurred before the deployment of this system to Ukraine and discussions about how many batteries should or should not be delivered, its main advantage is that it is much easier for the West to supply Pac-2 and Pac-3 missiles to replenish Ukrainian stocks than for the Russians to willingly offer a shipment of 48 N6 missiles for Ukrainian S-300s. The deployment of the Patriot alleviates some of the burden on Ukrainian S-300s, preventing their finite stocks from being depleted so rapidly. So the West can manufacture these missiles, right? It might not be super quick, but they can manufacture them. And there is a, arguably, in, in principle, a sustainable supply of missiles to, for the Patriot systems. And many countries operate the Patriot system so they can help out with their existing stockpiles and existing components. The S-300s, not so much. And it, it, the, those stocks are going to dwindle to nothing because the only person that's going to be, the only country that's going to be making them are, are Russia. Now, Greece has some missile launches and missiles that they are getting to Ukraine. That's going to be super helpful. But the Patriot coming online alleviates the stress on the on the S-300 stocks. And so actually they can, it's not like replacing, but they can work side by side or at least in different places uh, in Ukraine. Um, anyway, it's, uh, um, yes, so... I think that's uh, the end of that one. So uh, PAC-3. So the PAC-3 is a designation given to extremely deep ev evolution in the Patriot system. Several battery systems have been upgraded, but the main evolution was the introduction of the new missile called the MIM-104F also known as Pac-3. This missile was specifically or, yeah, specifically developed to deal with hypersonic threats and ballistic missiles and having an upgraded system and a missile specially designed to handle these threats made the battery much more effective in dealing with them. It's no wonder, therefore, that the Patriot is effective against the so-called unstoppable Russian hypersonic missiles. Utility. So the Patriot comes with the capability to integrate the, with Link-16. So Link-16 is that... Um, information system, radar network, comms between everything, basically, that you, that you can use all NATO equipment particularly. But now I think you're being able to plug in some of the uh, the legacy Soviet equipment with some adaptations, which means that you, you start getting a threat coming over and you can work out what the correct uh, air defense system that you want to deal with that threat. And Link 16 connects everything together, helps connect things together and then communicates with the with the different systems including pilots uh, flying and so you know that's part of it as well in fact I think it goes on to say that here because I can see the word F-16 so the main advantage of Link-16 is the integration of the Patriot battery with the F-16s being delivered to Ukraine with Link-16 an F-16 can show the Patriot a missile that it cannot see due to the curvature of the earth so remember with the curvature of the earth and this is where where videos like this are not cool for flat earthers because none of this makes sense. But with the curvature of the Earth, 
a radar has like blind spots as the radar goes sort of directly up like that as the earth curves if you have a low flying missile particularly you can't see it until it gets into that the the kind of the straight line going up that, that can't bend around the curve of the earth now that means that you're seeing these missiles too late what you need is something above. This is why you have your AWACS and the A50Us that fly up here and then can send their radar down. So you have radars going up like that and then radars going down like that and then you, you get a much greater coverage of, of a curved Earth. Uh, so the F-16 can also do that with their radar capabilities. Um, so it can show a Patriot missile that it cannot that you otherwise couldn't see due to the curvature of the Earth. And the Patriot's radar can show a Russian aircraft beyond the range of the F-16's radar. So not only does that add, so the F-16 adds the ability to see a Patriot to the, the radar that's back here that can only sort of go further up into the higher atmosphere over there here. But this has got such a, a good radar system, this is how I understand it, that it can see high flying airplanes that are, that are much further away than the F-16 can see. So both of them can work in unison with each other. Um, anyway, uh, to continue, this integration makes communication between fighter and battery fully automatic. None of this information needs to be exchanged between the pilot and the battery operator via radio. It simply appears on a tactical display of both the battery and the fighter. And this is, you know, really super important. Um, and with regard to automation, the Patriot has two main control, uh, sorry, combat modes, semi-automatic. So the system identifies targets, prioritizes them, and indicates the best available means to address the encounter with threats. The final decision remains with the operator or the automatic mode. The system identifies all targets, tracks them, assigns the necessary missiles to each target and fires them without the need for the battery operator to issue any commands. Both modes can be configured differently to classify specific targets as higher or lower priority depending on the operator's needs. For example, the Patriot radar detected three incoming missiles. Two are caliber cruise missiles and one is a Kinjal hypersonic missile. The system can autonomously determine the threat level of each missile considering the Kinjal more dangerous and allocate two or three pack interceptors to neutralize it while maintaining surveillance over the calibers to engage them after the Kinjal is destroyed. All this automation results in much lower target engagement times compared to older systems available to Ukraine, such as the S-300. So Ukraine and its somewhat less orthodox use. Now systems like Patriot and S-300 are not active all the time. Doing so would invite destruction of the system as their electronic emissions would easily identify them. So basically you don't turn the radar on, you maybe turn it on for short periods and then you might have to move it or so on and so forth, but these things are big to move. So generally you have them further set back where they're safer, not, not likely to get hit and things that do try and hit them you can shoot down yourself. If you bring them close to the front line, they can start being spotted by things like all land drones that then then you can shoot other things and, and and take them out so it's really high risk to bring them closer to the front line and much lower risk obviously to have them sat back around kiev where even if the even if the um the russians know where they are as batteries you know there'll be intelligence people like shipping that information back to russia for sure um they just can't take them out because the the various systems shoot down the missiles before they get there um you know, even the Kinjals appear to be unable. So they would want to, I guess, use some of their other ballistic missiles. But then, you know, I, it, it appears that the, the Patriots are good at taking down the ballistic missiles. So they end up shooting the ballistic missiles at other high tar high value targets that where Patriots aren't. Um, that's my guess anyway. It's common to keep uh, let's, let's read that again. So systems like Patriot and S300 are not active all the time. Doing so would invite destruction of the system. Uh, as their electronic emissions would easily identify them. It's common to keep only early warning radars like the old reliable P-15 and P-18 operational to have some idea of what is happening in the contested airspace. Your enemy will know that these early warning radars are there, but if the batteries are off, they present no electronic signals, making them virtually invisible. Currently, it is impossible to know exactly how the Ukrainians managed to ambush the, S30, the Su-34 and the A-50U, and we will only have the exact answers to that after the conflict. However, one possible way is this. There probably was an early warning radar in the region monitoring the routine flight of those aircraft. A few days of doing nothing against them and showing no opposition might have made the Russians confident. After all, they would. why would the Ukrainians move their valuable patriots away from their cities that need constant protection against Russian attacks? With guidance 
from the possible P15 or P18, indicating the approximate location of the targets, the Patriot operators don't need much to find their targets. Um, the system would automatically identify and choose the best method to engage the threats and the operators would launch a missile observing until the target is destroyed. All of this occurs in less than 30 seconds. Just enough time for the target to know it's being attacked but not enough time to accurately triangulate the battery's location and definitely not enough time for Russia to mount a response or destroy it as they would already be preparing to leave. 100% uh, so anyway, uh, uh, he's going on to talk about um, who wrote that. So anyway, uh, that's hopefully some useful information on the difference between the Patriot and the S300s and why it's very useful for the uh, Patriots to be in Ukraine, for the Ukrainians, super useful. So now we're going to go on to something just to finish off today, uh, something completely different, I guess, from the Russia-Ukraine war context, but actually... It's kind of it's geopolitical and it's related to democracies and so on and so forth. Now, this I just I found this an interesting thread, and I, I want you to listen to this. But like, if you're a fan of Biden, don't think yeah Biden cool. Or and if you hate Biden, don't go oh, I hate Biden. And if you like love America, don't go, yay, America. And if you hate America, don't go, oh, American imperialism. Just be aware of what your kind of baggage that you're bringing to these evaluations. Like there was probably a, a, a point in my life, maybe 10 years ago, I would have more likely looked at this as American imperialism. But now I understand how fragile global democracies are often are now there there are times i mean there's a great democ uh, a great documentary by john pilger called war on democracy which does look at how the us has um in a clandestine fashion using the cia un uh, like basically uh, worked to unseat democratically elected administrations unseat's probably the wrong word in south america since the second world war and and some of those moves have been a bit spurious but i also so there is this idea that there is a kind of american imperialism that's mixed up with sort of a free market corporate ideology that that looks at anything that doesn't fit into that mold as some kind of evil socialist communism therefore we've got to do away with that so there is that element, but there are also I think we're in a, we're at a time in history now where actually genuinely there are there there are threats on democracies. You you look at Europe and you look at Hungary and you look at maybe Slovakia to a degree and how that is and and the Balkans and what's going on there. And then you look around the rest of the world and you're thinking, oh, we're on a knife edge here as, as to a, to what which direction that country is going to go in and that country is democratically backsliding. And so we need to work really hard to defend uh, democracies where they are established. And it is you can't rest on your laurels and you can't take uh, democratic institutions and mechanisms and freedoms for granted. OK, so, so that's a context I want you to understand this next thread in. Um, so, yeah, we'll go to look at this. So one of Joe Biden, this is from Oliver Stunkel, who is, uh, I presume, from Brazil, actually. Uh, one of Joe Biden's most significant foreign policy achievements to date remains curiously overlooked. Mounting evidence suggests the US government was crucial to keep pro-Bolsonaro generals at bay in 2022 when Brazil's democracy was on the brink. So if you remember, Jair Bolsonaro lost uh, a, a, um, an election to the silver and there was a storming, of, there was like a January the 6th parallel that happened and it was all very close to actually almost being a coup but we didn't quite realize how close it, that it was to being a coup especially given Bolsonaro's like he was I mean I would avowedly say he was dictatorial and authoritarian uh, and being a military man was very much involved with the military as well 
So court documents related to a recent police raid suggest that Bolsonaro personally edited a decree that would have overturned election results and imprisoned a Supreme Court justice. A general loyal to the president confirmed he would provide the troops needed to carry out the coup. In the end, however, the coup mongers did not get their way, in part due to divisions within Brazil's armed forces that were the target of concerted pro-democracy efforts by the US President Joe Biden. Biden mounted, and by Biden, obviously, you know, it's not him, is 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 his administration and, and the mechanisms of the US government. Quite often we talk uh, in terms of the figurehead of a nation when, you know, Joe Biden would have been not as aware of, of, I mean, it would have been aware and would be involved in decision making, but you know, there, there are there's more to to it than a single human. Nonetheless, Biden mounted a in 2022 a sustained pressure campaign aimed at Brazil's military, making clear that a democratic rupture would leave Brazil isolated on the international stage and lead to a downgrade of U.S. Brazil security cooperation, which is highly valued by Brazil's generals. So this is a bit of arm twisting, saying, "Okay, we're aware that you might be making some moves to, that look pretty undemocratic to us. Just to let you know, if you do that, we ain't going to help you out with X, Y, and Z." Right. So it's, it's that 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 pressure that can be put on in in so many different ways. Uh, you can talk about trade pressure. You can talk about military cooperation pr pressure, political pressure. Uh, the campaign involved the U.S. White House, State Department, CIA, Senate and notably the Pentagon. In retrospect, including that uh, that last agency may have been the Biden administration's most decisive move. U.S. Secretary of Defense Austin became the chief public emissary to Brazil's generals given the tense relationship between Biden and Bolsonaro, the latter of whom followed Trump's lead in parroting falsehoods about supposed fraud during the 2020 pres U.S. presidential election. So he's saying that about the Brazilian election. Biden also played a crucial role in helping Brazil's electoral authorities overcome a global chip shortage to outfit electronic voting machines and ensure a smooth contest. It's stuff like this that we just don't have a clue. We don't know what goes on behind the scenes so often in in international politics and in all those kind of shenanigans that are taking place. And it's just incredible to think here, you know, they were they were worried about, like their their election was on on a knife edge anyway and as so if you go back in time and remember what was going on before the the Brazilian election and and the idea that they needed microchips to to get voting machines up up and running so that they could have a proper democrat fair and fair, free and fair election and that the US was involved in facilitating that we just don't know that these things happen it is quite incredible uh, Bolsonaro would have latched onto any technical difficulties as supposed evidence of machines' unreliability. It seems rather obvious that, under Trump, the United States would not have played the same constructive role in helping Brazil fend off the most serious threat to its democracy in decades. That is, I would argue, demonstrably true. So Biden... Uh, sorry, Trump and Bolsonaro were good friends and... In fact, he showed support for Bolsonaro, Trump, and his family, in and and vice versa, actually. But but in terms of the the, the kind of attack of the Supreme Court and the, the post election situation, and for Bolsonaro since then, Trump has very publicly showed support. So you can bet your bottom dollar that had that been a Trump presidency, that Bolsonaro would now be um, president of Brazil. And the, 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 the fair elections that took place would have been overturned unfairly. And despite what you think about uh, Luis Ignacio de Silva, you know, that's irrelevant. We're talking about a, a peaceful transfer of power. And, you know, Trump didn't want that with, with his own transfer of power to Biden and certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't have sanctioned a peaceful transfer of power uh, to, uh, I think, to Silva. So really interesting and and again talks to this this idea that there are people working hard behind the scenes all over the world making sure or trying to make sure that democracy prevails in in what is a very fractious and fragile, fragile world that we live in 
just quite incredible uh, to me. And anyway, last thing, bit of a positive little story here. Um, here we have um, a Ukrainian soldier during battle. Uh, he Mikola lost his arm, but not his resilience. After a tough recovery and training with bionic prosthesis, prosthesis uh, by Esper Bionics, his, he's back to his former occupation, crafting. But instead of appliances, he builds reconnaissance FPV drones with incredible precision. So let's go... <laughs> watch that uh, a little bit more closely there now what i um what i've been wondering about a lot actually is people who have been injured and disabled and are unable to go back to the front lines i'm sure ukraine are onto this but there are there is a place for these people to help with so many roles that you don't need you know full working limbs for um particularly maybe your legs but um you know, whether it's administrative roles within the armed forces, whether it's you know, making FPV drones, all this kind of stuff, there is a place for, for the disabled for sure. And that gives them obviously a purpose and, and you know, all the psychological benefits of that. But also it frees up people to then go and be moved to the front line. I mean, it sounds pretty harsh, but, you know, in, in, a, in a, at a time when the Ukrainians are absolutely desperate for boots on the ground, Losing people to uh, to disability doesn't mean uh, a net loss. It doesn't have to mean a net loss. Y yes, there's a lot of work on rehabilitation, but if they can be rehabilitated and reintegrated into the working world, then there are many roles that they can take up that will then free up other people to then be moved and 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 do other things. And so. You know, it's really good to see that, and I'm and I'm sure it's happening an awful lot in many different ways. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate your support. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.